Hi everyone, Dr. Samantha Cotrera here, the Principal Storytelling Officer for the Hiswar Source Source Story video series, a video series for Canadian history teachers, where we get to talk with archivists and historians and activists and a whole bunch of people about particular sources in Canadian history and how it can tell new, challenging counter stories about the Canadian past that you can bring into your classroom. Um, it has been so wonderful to have this series. We are winding down the series, which is so sad. Our funding is up and you know, we're just kind of, you know, finishing this series, which is really sad, but it's really exciting to have these videos, these conversations kind of lead us to the end because in some ways, especially this, um, uh, uh, this particular conversation kind of brings us full circle. So I'm really excited about that. Now, before I introduce who we have coming up, just a reminder that we have all of these social media um, that talk about all the different things that we have. Please like and subscribe and comment so other people can see these videos and that you can stay abreast of the videos that we have when we are publishing them. So please make sure that you are part of the loop. So today we are talking with Dr. Ian Mosby. Um, he is a historian of food, Canadian food, settler politics, colonialism, indigenous food. And he has been mentioned in one of our videos before. Last year, we talked with Dr. Madeline Mant. We talked about the Canadian food guide. We talked about how something like an egg can be brought into the classroom as a source. And we talked a little bit about the politics of the Canadian food guide, but we didn't get into it too much because I wanted Dr. Ian Mosby to come in and talk about it. And that's what we're talking about today. Ian Mosby works at Toronto Metropolitan University and is the author of Food Will Win the War, uh, The Politics, Culture, and Science of Food on Canada's Home Front. And so it's really exciting to be able to pair the two conversations together, to think about bringing in an egg to start the conversation, and then even go deeper with talking about the Candace Food Guide from a historical perspective that we're gonna be talking about today. So let's go over to Zoom. Let's be introduced to Ian. I can't wait for this conversation. He does such fantastic work, both as, as a historian, but also like, as a community activist, a, a historian activist, his work related to indigeneity and settler politics just goes beyond just food conversations. And it's really, really a privilege to be able to talk with him for this series. So let's go over to Zoom. Ian, I am so excited to be able to talk to you today. Thank you so much for finding time. I was saying in my introduction, it feels a little bit like full circle because one of our first videos uh, last year, we talked about your work and I'm really excited that we get to talk with you directly about it. Um, but before we get started, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Uh, I'm Dr. Ian Mosby. I am an assistant professor in the Department of History at Toronto Metropolitan University. Great, thank you. Um, and so, when we talked, uh, when we talked about your work <laughs> last time, we used an egg as a source to talk about, um, like all the different things that you can like lead use ordinary objects to lead into much broader conversations and the example that was used was the Canada Food Guide and so although you don't have an egg I'm pretty sure you don't have an egg today <laughs> I don't know <laughs> yeah <laughs> what is your source so my source is sort of the precursor to Canada's Food Guide it's the original Canada's Food Guide would have the amazing name of Canada's Official Food Rules. Mm, dun, dun, so. dun. <laughs> Let's go over to screen share and put that up. Yeah. So this is a copy of the original Canada's Official Food Rules. It was published in a pamphlet by the Swift Canadian Co. Meat Company um, called Eat Right to Work and Win. And... Yeah, you know, there's many things to love about this, including um, these anthropomorphic eggs and uh, armed milk. Armed milk. <laughs> um, but this this really became the heart of Canadian nutrition education and advice and even research, actually, uh, in throughout the 1940s through the 1950s uh, until in 1961, uh, its name was changed to Canada's Food Guide, uh, which we know now. Uh, and there's been a whole bunch of different revisions to Canada's food guide. I think I, I gave you some pictures of um, just two more of those. Yeah, here's the 1977 edition, which is what I rec re recognized from my elementary school classrooms. It was often hanging up in the corner. And then the 1992 food guide, which I learned uh, one of my favorite classes in high school was foods. 
And so I ended up taking foods up until uh, uh, grade 12. And I think it was basically what home economics became, but I loved it because I got to cook every day and have something to eat. Um, and so I was very familiar with the food guide. And this is that is sort of really what got me interested in um, looking at it as sort of a, a primary source. Um, and it actually got started, you know, I wrote a book <laughs> in the end. Um, and it started with the question of, you know, why does Canada's food guide look the way it does? Um, and so this is a source that, you know, has a lot of uh, meaning for me. Um, and it turns out the answer to that question of why it looks the way it does is is a pretty interesting one, at least, <laughs> at least I think so. Yeah, and I'm I'm really excited to get into that. But I, I just want to flag like the design of it and the connections that that people have, because, I mean, as you know, as a historian, as an educator, having some sort of hook that's a personal connection is so important for people to get into it. And also teachers, if your students are taking food, let them know they can be a food historian and work at Toronto Metropolitan University one day <laughs> uh, when you retire, obviously not to take your current job. But I think of the 1992 version, and I don't think we're that different in age, but I've never really seen the 1977 one. And it's really interesting, like the the rainbow of food is so kind of baked pun intended, into my brain. And it's so interesting that like ed educators, teachers can bring in their own memories of the food guide into their classroom before they even introduced it as a historical object. Yeah, I think, you know, and I, another primary source that I was very much aware of at the time would be the U.S. food pyramid, right? It was always comparing the food pyramid to the food guide. They have you know, especially this rainbow version in which there's the meat and alternatives is smaller and the grain products is bigger um, with the notion that you eat more grain products and less meat and alternatives, um, but somehow you eat more grain than you do vegetables and fruit. Um, so comparing those as well, this, this was always a question to me and noticing that different countries had different nutrition advice and thinking, well, what's going on? Like, why, why isn't there sort of a universal of, of healthy eating? And also, you know, why do I need to eat milk? Or why do I need to eat milk products and drink milk? Um, well, because it might shoot you. As... <laughs> it, it, because it, <laughs> I mean, sorry, did you not see that? On the first one? It, That's true, it actually. This is all coming together now. I, yeah. think, I think I need to revise my book. <laughs> so you said that, um, you said that, you know, when you actually start asking the questions about how these decisions were made the way they are, it actually is quite an interesting story. So the most logical question, especially for our series, is what is that story? Yeah, well, it really comes down to, you know, the first one came out in 1942. The most important thing that was happening in 1942 was, you know, there was a world war going on. It's global conflict, brutal global conflict. Um, and Canadians were on a war footing. And so, you know, the answer to the, the simple answer to the question of why did Canada's food guide emerge? It emerged because, you know, Canadians were at war and there was a real concern that malnutrition was hampering the war effort. And so when I started to look into it, you know, the, the evidence that malnutrition was hampering the war effort came from a number of different nutritional surveys that were done in major Canadian cities. Uh, there was two surveys done in Toronto. There was a survey done in Edmonton, a uh, survey done in Halifax, Quebec City. And these surveys showed widespread malnutrition, but like in, in levels that are, you know, might be kind of surprising and actually were really surprising to me, showing that 60% of Canadians were malnourished. Um, in one of the Toronto surveys, they showed only 3%, I believe, of Canadians were getting enough, or Torontonians were getting enough calories. And I started asking myself, these, you know, these surveys were done in 1939, uh, 1938, 1940. And, you know, once I started looking at it, I was like, these are kind of really shocking numbers. And, you know, people I've talked to who were around at that time, did not remember it as a time of major malnutrition. And so that led me down the rabbit hole to actually looking at how those studies were done and what the concept of malnutrition means. And it turned out it's a really complicated answer, um, but it comes down to it as, you know, the notion of malnutrition, people, you know, it's, it's not a natural thing and it's still not a natural thing. It's people have to make decisions about what it means to, to have a healthy diet. And those decisions have as much social content as they do scientific content. 
this question may be like super obvious or it may may be a bit of a curveball but like the there is so much and there there is so much currently and there was so much i'm hearing from what you're saying in relationship to those early studies um judgment um about food choices and about what uh, ideal healthiness is did this start during this period or was this already was this were these decisions already baked in or were these decisions being made by the choices the researchers were making Mm, it's a great question and i think one of the things about food is we always have sort of our cultural values determine how we think about food and they always have you know Mm -hmm. even before scientific nutrition existed you know, it started in the 19th century, but vitamins were really only discovered uh, and began to be understood in the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s. Um, but previous ideas about the morality of how people ate had an impact on the ways in which these early nutrition researchers who were trying to figure out, for instance, when they discover, you know, what vitamin A is, and they discover it's something that actually exists that previously they didn't know, um, they had to start asking the question of like, well, how much vitamin A is enough? And how much is too much? Or is there such thing as too much? Um, And those questions started to get tacked on to existing ideas about why people, um, you know, don't eat the right foods. And those have always been connected to notions of morality, right? It's the idea that the poor are poor because they make poor choices. (laughs) Um, And so a lot of the ways that people talked about food before, for instance, the science of vitamins, Uh, was discovered, you know, looked a lot like it did afterwards, even, you know, there's all these changes. And a lot of it had to do with people, you know, um, with certain class and racial privilege, um, telling people, you know, who, um, you know, who were poor or working class or not white, um, that the problems they were having, the, you know, the, the burden of sickness that they faced, you know, their higher death rates, um, their lower life expectancy, that was due to poor choices they were making. Um, it turns out that, you know, the science can completely change through this revolution, nutritional revolution, but the advice looks a lot very similar. So for instance, that one Toronto study I was talking about that showed, you know, a tiny percentage of people supposedly getting sufficient calories. The conclusion to the study was not that wages should be higher. It's that people need to be better educated about how to spend their money. Um, and so this really fit into, you know, the way these studies worked. And at the same time, you know, because these sort of moral visions of like what a healthy diet is or how a person should be in the world are different depending on who you are, other people took up nutrition and argued the exact opposite. And they argued that this is an example of why capitalism is failing. This is an example of why we need you know, everything from full revolution to why we need uh, the a, a welfare state, unemployment insurance, family allowances, school lunches. And so we see these kind of the political debates that existed at the time that already were happening. Um, food became suddenly a really key tool because it added a scientific gloss to existing arguments about, um, you know, how Canada how, you know, Ontario, how Saskatchewan, whatever it was, you know, level of politics are talking about how they should operate. Mm -hmm. And so this became, you know, this was always behind what was going on in the science of nutrition, in terms of determining what constituted, you know, a minimum adequate diet, um, but also nutrition education materials like the food guide, which set forth a really specific idea of how to eat um, that was very culturally um, you know, spoke to a specific culture, <laughs> um, this sort of Anglo-European culture. Um, and it turns out, for instance, if you were a Chinese person living in the Strathcona neighborhood of Vancouver, uh, just for one example, who they did a study of, they found that none of the children were properly nourished. They found 0% of the children. But then when they started to look at it, these kids were eating way more uh, vegetables, way more organ meats, um, you know, but they were eating rice instead of bread, you know, they were drinking tea instead of milk. And so kids who were actually probably pretty healthy, um, according to the food guide, though, they were malnourished. And so 
suddenly we see the ways in which larger political discourses and ways we talk about Canadian citizenship start to get defined by seemingly, you know, um, simple educational tools like Canada's Food Guide. There, thank you for all of that. There's so much in there. There's there's a couple observations I want to make, some follow-up questions. I'm trying to like figure out the best <laughs> order. Okay, well, I'll, I'll say some things that you don't necessarily need to respond to, although of course you can, but some of the things that I was thinking of are like, number one, that this is actually a really good historical example to also cross list for um, high school teachers with courses on sociology and anthropology to really also talk about like what is objective in research and really how research can never be objective because <laughs> because before and after was very, very similar and what that looks like to bring in all these preconceived notions of what health is and what proper uh, food is um, before you start some before you start a research project and then surprise you prove your point. So that's one thing I want to think of. The other thing is also this conversation is really great to bring in the notion of class because you know when we say the Candace Food Guide for me at least I think of like okay everyone that lives in Canada, this is just kind of a blanket thing, but especially in 1942, when it first came out, that it's really, it's not for like all Canadians, because not all Canadians kind of needed it. And so to bring in notions of class, but also notions of race, which I, I do want to talk about more directly in a second. But I remember in the 1992 version, there is like chopsticks and rice are in the grain part in that yellow part. And I remember there, I remember the discourse around it being like, look, look how inclusive and revolutionary <laughs> we are. And, and like the ways that what is, uh, what like su is supposedly Canadian culture is again brought into these seemingly objective things, right? And that now we can include diversity um, and look how great we are because now we can be multicultural. And so there's just like a few things there. I don't know if there's anything you want to respond to because there wasn't a question necessarily. Well, no, I think I think that's like a really important point. You can kind of see the ways in which value, cultural values, yeah, like particularly this value of multiculturalism, which becomes an official policy in the late 1960s. Um, and they start to have to adapt things like the food guide, right, to represent multiculturalism, but it's always never quite the entire way. So if you look at that 1992 version, it still has milk as a food group. We have large swaths of the global population who are lactose intolerant. And we know for a fact that those people do not need to consume milk to be healthy, right? And they knew that at the time in 1992. And there's a whole bunch of reasons <laughs> why milk is in the food guide. A big part of it has to do with the power of the milk lobby, just for instance. So like milk in the original food guide, there didn't need to be a milk lobby to tell nutrition experts to put milk in because they were white Protestant uh, or maybe occasionally a white Catholic scientist, me mostly men. Um, and they had a very specific vision about what healthy diets were already and milk was part of it. Um, so that that's really important to think about. <clears throat> um, if you just want, there's actually a slide um, of a number of Inuit women looking at a copy of the food guide. I think it's like the second to last one. Sure, let's go over to screen share. Here, for instance, is a poster uh, advertising family allowances, um, which was a huge program, and it's it's. Uh, it has Inuktitut language on it. Um, there's there's women in Nunavut, you know, looking at this poster, you know, this is sort of an official government poster. So it's kind of weird that it's on the floor and not on the wall. Um, you know, and you can see this, this is sort of talking about how family allowances are gonna work and, and explaining to these women and family allowances were a um, social welfare, pro a universal social welfare program that had huge impacts on Canadians. Um, of all kinds, increase incomes dramatically, particularly among the very poor and particularly among Indigenous peoples. One of the things you can look at this image and, you know, there's a couple things that are hidden in here in that uh, Inuit women uh, and a lot of First Nations uh, families receive family allowances not as cash, 
as the rest of Canadians would have received it, but they received it in kind. And so they had to purchase certain kinds of foods. What kind of foods did they have to purchase? Well, it turns out that the Canada Food Guide became the model for how Inuit and First Nations women and uh, uh, Métis women in, in Métis settlements um, would receive their family allowances. And so suddenly they're being told how to eat and, you know, things that they receive are like cans of click, you know, canned meat, um, pablum, infant food, uh, and being encouraged to wean their children earlier. Suddenly there's things in it like powdered milk or canned milk. Um, you know, these are things that, you know, when, if you look at Inuit people's diets, they're not malnourished by any sense of the, you know, it's not the Inuit diet that's the problem. It's Canadian colonialism. It's the fact that Inuit people are being um, forcibly removed during this period to high Arctic settlements. Um, you know, the impact of colonialism on people's diets means there's simply not enough uh, wild game because there's, you know, huge construction of military outposts, all of this stuff. And so if you go to the, the other slide then of First Nations women in British Columbia, um, these kind of things start to look a little less um, sort of neutral <laughs> um, because this is about uh, the state telling Indigenous peoples what they can buy. Right. And this is important, too, because, you know, everyone else in Canada got their family allowances as cash and they could buy whatever they wanted. Indigenous peoples, not so much. They got their family allowances as in kind. And the food guide then became something that they had to eat. It wasn't simply something they were recommended to eat. And so it starts to look a little bit different when you start to look at, well, how, you know, how did different people experience the food guide? Well, for indigenous peoples, it was something that transformed their diets and often in really harmful ways. When we think about things like, um, you know, the kinds of foods that were being provided in kind by Hudson's Bay Company stores, just to give one example. Um, and so this is also important when we start to look beyond simply, um, you know, the creation of the food guide, we start to look at how it actually impacted people's diets over time. Other things that happen is, you know, if a social worker would come into a family home and decide whether or not they were good parents, what is the model they would use to decide whether or not children are being fed properly? Oh, it was the Canada's food guide. And guess which cultures are going to be more affected by, you know, what a social worker decides is healthy or not. Oh, it turns out it's non-white, non-European peoples. Um, and so then it becomes a tool of oppression. Child people's children could be taken away. Um, this is pretty important stuff, um, and it kind of changes the way we read these sorts of, um, you know, the fact that it was originally called Canada's food rules, right? These are like rules right. for not just how to eat healthy, but also how to, how to be a Canadian. You know, what's interesting about these photographs, and thank you so much for, for sharing them with us. Well, first is just how natural they are. Like, they're just such an organic, relaxing <laughs> photograph. Like, I have just family albums full of photos like this. Um, just staring at the family lounge poster <laughs> on the floor. Yeah, I know. It's ye old, <laughs> ye old classic photo. Um, I mean, obviously how staged they are and how they are really, dem like, they are supposed to be educational to demonstrate the reverence of it and that they are all women right? Like the, we talked a little bit about class. We talked a little bit about race and we didn't mention gender before, but here it is, right? Like this is also, um, this is also directives, particularly towards mothers about what good motherhood is and what good nutrition is. And that kind of intersection is really interesting. Before before we um, before you respond to that, could you talk actually a little bit about the family allowances, just kind of as a general concept, and then bring in or reiterate some of the stuff that you were talking about with for Na First Nations and Inuit families? I think that we don't we don't want to get that lost if people aren't used to teaching about the family allowances in their classrooms. Yeah, family allowance, you know, one way to think about it is we we now have like um, tax credits um, and that's sort of the ways in which um, social programs are delivered in, in a lot of cases. Um, what happened at the end of World War II though is Canadians, you know, one of their experience actually of the war 
instead of making, you know, things like rationing were introduced, food rationing, um, there was rationing of other goods like gasoline. Um, there was also price control. So the government stepped in in a huge way, took over entire industries. So a lot of industries were turned over to war production. Um, the government took control of the distribution of basic foodstuffs. You know, they, they created crown corporations to, to import and export goods. Um, one of the things that happened is Canadians actually liked what they saw. Instead of being seeing this as a negative thing of the government coming in and, um, you know, um, overstepping its bounds, a lot of Canadians began to turn to um, political parties that were arguing for a more robust interventionist government. And so one of the things we saw at the, by the end of the war is every political party, not just, you know, social, social democratic parties, but the Liberal Party and the Conservative Party all turned towards a more interventionist state. That was one of their big promises is after the war is over, you know, your sacrifices are going to be acknowledged and we're going to, you know, um, make sure that the cost of living stays down, right? We're going to make sure that you have enough food, that you have a house over your head. And the biggest sort of central plank of that was something called the Family Allowance Program. And it's the it was the idea that people with children have greater expenses and that's not reflected in their wages, right? So someone who has six children makes this and works, you know, uh, at a sawmill will make the same wages as someone who has no children who does the same job. And so the idea was people with children need extra money in order to make sure that their families are taken care of. And so they introduced something called the family allowance, which was um, a cash payment, uh, a monthly cash payment per child in a family. And this is why it was such a huge, um, had such a huge impact on people is in many cases, especially for low income people, they often saw their income rise by 25%, especially for people with larger families. And this was in cash. And so they could spend the cash on, on what they needed. Um, and so, and it was a hugely popular program. <laughs> it was, you know, one of the reasons why the liberal party, you know, uh, uh, won the, the first multiple post-war elections was in part of because of programs like family allowances, hospital insurance, you know, and so we see this rise of a more interventionist state and the family allowance becomes the sort of the symbol of it. Uh, and it's really popular. Uh, like you can imagine when you <laughs> suddenly your income expands, um, you know, people, people really responded well to it. And so it kind of changed the dynamic in Canada and we can see, um, things like, for instance, national health insurance, Medicare, um, being part of this growing faith that the government can deliver services uh, and social programs that before that people were much more skeptical, I think, that the government could do that, or there was a smaller political um, support for those kinds of programs. You know, it's this is such an interesting element to, to teach to students, but also to have discussions with students about it, given that there is a, I think, increasing distrust about the government and about social services and things like that. And I, I wonder how an average 15 year old would think of that and whether they would see the benefit in it or feel, you know, I wonder what their response would be because of how positively it was, um, uh, it, it was kind of accepted by Canadians and um, as as a as a key social project, right? And we see that with other social services during this um, this period. So it's interesting that while it was a very popular program, like you were saying before, it's also a program that that legitimized certain forms of oppression for, um, or I should say legitimize certain forms of colonialism is actually maybe a better way to say it. And how food is such a key part of that. And if we're thinking that this is the same period where still students were still going off to residential schools, the 60s scoop was about to be an element that was going to be a part of social services. It's kind of interesting that we have to think about the ways that the state is mobilized in ways that can be really positive for taking care of people that live on or in this nation, but also use the same mechanisms for um, oppression and colonialism and for exercising that power in really negative ways, right? Like that, that constant tension. Well, just to, just to give you an example of like a, a direct example, I think one of the slides is a 
photo of Lionel Pett, who was the, um, he was the head of the nutrition division that came up with the food guide. Um, so, and he was essentially the architect of the food guide itself, as well as the architect of the dietary standard it was based upon, which is sort of the scientific basis. Um, you know, one of the things they discovered during the war is uh, the nutrition division was put in charge of inspecting federal facilities. And so they inspected prisons, they inspected war um, uh, production facilities. They also inspected residential schools. And at each of these inspections, they came in with different ways of measuring um, how good the diets were. But the main way they came, came up with actually was the food guide. They would go in with the food guide into say a war production plant and they would look at the meals that were being fed to, um, to employees and they would check it against the food guide and decide, determine whether that food was healthy or not. And then they would give recommendations. Well, when they went to residential schools, they were shocked that, you know, none of the schools met the requirements of the food guide. Um, and in fact, when they started to use other measures of uh, nutrition, including, you know, physical examinations of children, they found that the children were not just, you know, being underfed, they were actually physically malnourished. Many had clinical signs of malnutrition. Um, one of the things that Pet decided to do instead of, you know, insisting on major changes and upheavals to, um, to residential school diets, and he did make some recommendations on how to improve them. Within a few years, they didn't improve. And so Pet had this population of malnourished indigenous children, and he decided that this was a good opportunity to test whether or not things like the Canadian dietary standard were accurate by testing different dietary interventions on Indigenous children in residential schools. And what happened was it ended up being um, a series of nutrition experiments over the course of five years in residential schools on malnourished children who were already malnourished because the food in residential schools was so inadequate. And so for PET, it became an opportunity for scientific research. And so here we have the guy who designed Canada's Food Guide also doing medical research on indigenous kids in residential schools to answer questions about, you know, basic nutritional science. Um, and so this is, you know, when you when you talk about this, you know, it's not just about the food guide. It's also about all of the, the um, you know, ways in which nutrition was mobilized. And one of the ways it was mobilized was, you know, to to conduct um, pretty unethical experiments on indigenous kids. And that finding, that that information about those experiments, that was something that was fairly fairly new that was identified, passive voice, so that you can talk about that a little bit more, um, right? Yeah, um, you know, when I did the research for my book, um, you know, I wanted to look at all elements of... Um, food and nutrition in Canada during the Second World War. And it was by getting to know people like Lionel Pett and their role creating the food guide uh, that it came upon documents outlining those experiments. And a journalist uh, in the early 2000s had found some of those documents, but he didn't quite, because he didn't have the background, I think in the history of nutrition, he didn't really realize what he'd found. Uh, he knew he found some things where kids had had um, uh, dental work withheld from them because they're part of these experiments. Uh, and so I was, I was able to expand upon uh, his work and show that these were serious experiments done over the long term with, you know, that point to the ways in which, you know, sort of the total um, horrors of residential school, right? You are not only taken from your family you are not only uh, stripped of your language and your culture, you're not only separated from other family members, even in the same school, you're also malnourished because the school, you know, one of the things Lionel Pett found is he found most schools, the um, funding that the federal government provided for food was about half what was needed to purchase sufficient food. Um, and then even when, you know, the federal government itself discovers that it's underfeeding you, they might conduct a medical experiment on you, you know, and this wasn't the only medical experiment conducted in residential schools. And so sort of, 
the, the sort of horror of residential schooling, this is just, you know, one more example, right? And I've, I've worked with survivors of these experiments. And that was the clear, clear message to me is these experiments were just one more thing on top of the worst experiences of these people's lives um, that, you know, um, trauma that is sort of almost unimaginable. Um, and so, yeah, it's, you know, that's changed the director. So that's, I went from being a historian of the food guide to being a historian of medical experimentation on indigenous peoples in part through asking these questions, trying to figure out like, where did the food guide go? How did, how did it work? And that kind of research then leads you to these bigger questions and you start to, you know, I didn't expect to find medical experiments. I also didn't expect settler colonialism in a Canadian context, um, to play such a big role in my research because you know my background is a historian of science and medicine um but the histories of science and medicine can are very much about research on indigenous peoples right they become subjects of research in part because they become captive populations according to the federal government they're wards of the state right which means that they have uh limited rights under things like the indian act um and also their children are being taken away and put in institutions. They're being institutionalized in prisons at much, much higher levels. They're being institutionalized in hospitals and sanatoria at much, much higher levels. And this makes indigenous peoples much more vulnerable to abuse by uh, scientists uh, and medical researchers. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we got to reference that research that you did, but I think that the categorization that you were like, I went from this type of researcher to this type or this type of historian to that isn't, isn't, you know, a great binary because I think that that is what like good history for me does, right? It, it goes that step deeper. That doesn't just kind of window dresses the stories that we think we know but really ask those broader questions about the the stuff that underlays so much of what we take for granted in our in our bodies but also in our states in our nations um and i think it's so powerful to be able to bring those discussions into classrooms when we're talking about these things so that it's not that we don't think of them as separate, that they are very yeah. inter interconnected and to acknowledge that it we we don't know everything and that yes. to be able to find room to be able to say like there were other things that happened. And I've talked to some historians where we just know there are no records about the people we're talking about. And so like what does using your imagination or asking broader questions that we don't necessarily have sources for, what can that do to what to how we understand the past and the present, I think is really powerful. So it's really interesting that you found these records to tell these stories and to be able to still connect with um, people who were part of those experiments to be able to get their stories like that. I mean, that is such a, a gift in being able to tell a, a very full history there. Yeah, and you know, I feel very, I feel very lucky that I've, um that my research has like reached people in ways that I never expected. Yeah. Um, and it's, it is interesting the way you talk about, you know, these histories are different. I'm the same historian and I have the same skills, but within the profession and maybe within the larger community, right. Those are all, those are seen as very different types of history. And as yeah. a very, I'm seen as a very different type of historian, even though, I have the same skills. I read the same books, right? I'm getting very um, angry right now, just so you know, like not at you, <laughs> but like at the point you're about to get at. <laughs> I'm like, my whole body's like. Rrr, rrr. Oh, I'll, well, and, you know, I and I, I think I'm genuinely now like an interdisciplinary historian. I see that yeah. as like a really defining feature. I, I will tell you that, you know, having been on the job market for a long time, people do not want to hire interdisciplinary historians. And yeah. so this is a problem I think profession really needs to deal with um is the way in which we talk about the work we do um and these sort of disciplinary blinders and so I feel really grateful that I get to do this you know currently my research does everything from you know I'm doing community-based oral history projects to you know really getting into the archives and doing access to information requests and you know writing about you know everything from 
unemployment and social policy to, you know, the origins of research ethics. Um, and that feels good to me. That feels right. Cause those things are all connected actually. Um, but it's hard to see sometimes. And mm -hmm. so hopefully, yeah, this career trajectory that I have um, <laughs> kind of speaks to that. Like you can, you can do curiosity based research that is bounded in a really specific question. Like why is the food guide the way it is? And that can open up a whole bunch of different uh, arenas. So, and that's that's been really, you know, one of the best things that I, I can say about working with indigenous communities affected by these experiments is people ask me a lot of questions and they expected me to find answers. And so that's my entire career since, you know, I published that article in 2013 has been answering the questions posed to me by survivors. And so every time I finish that work, I feel really good that it's useful and it's helping people in ways that they can, that is, you know, um, helping them to overcome this trauma or also helping to answer these really important questions. Like for instance, what was the health effect of hunger in residential school? Well, it turns out that those health effects, you know, impacted people for the rest of their lives, impacted their children. Um, you know, what was the effect of the dental treatment that people received in residential school? That's another question that a lot of survivors ask me. Uh, turns out, you know, pretty serious. And also the causes of it were the same as the causes of malnutrition in residential schools, which is intentional underfunding by the federal government of indigenous health, education, uh, welfare. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, basically all services that other Canadians receive, indigenous peoples receive just a fraction of those, those services. And these are just examples. So hopefully my research kind of um, is, a, is an example of if you have a good question and the best way to get a good question is to listen to other people and what their what their good questions are. Uh, you can you can actually find out some really useful stuff that people um, will respond to in in powerful ways. Yeah, I mean, I just want to talk about that and not but the food guide for a few minutes <laughs> because I oh I'm just gonna get all ranty because like what would history in the profession of history look like if we thought of it as acts of service as we thought of it by answering questions by people affected by certain things by community members they them asking the questions about about cause and effect and about life experiences and about the shaping of certain um certain lives and and certain opportunities what what would the history profession look like if it was thought of as service in in kind of a community way and well i yeah okay go i would argue that most of the historians i know that is how they came up with their main projects and the people yeah. i know who didn't who thought that they had to write on a certain topic you know did not have as much success and it's it's really because it's really hard yeah. and when you're doing like a phd which is extremely difficult and stressful i think if you're not emotionally connected to it in some way and it doesn't matter to you it's much harder to do that research and so i do think that that is what our profession looks like but we don't talk about it enough we don't talk right. about the ways in which you know uh answering these questions about you know what 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 is the impact of you know industrialization on on river systems or what is the impact of sort of special educations on on the lives of children for instance like these are questions that very close friends of mine ended up doing their mm -hmm. entire projects on and the passion that they have for that really shows i think and so yeah. maybe that's something i think as a profession and maybe as like high school teachers to really get across is that like if you care about something it makes it you know it gives you that ability to really pursue it to to the levels in which it can make a difference right in which yeah. because it makes a difference to you like the, answering this question is really important to you um and i found that with my research the stuff that is really spoken to other people is because they have the same question right uh, one of the first articles i ever had published was based on the question that I had is, why was it only Chinese restaurants that had no MSG signs, you know, when right. MSG was in most uh, processed foods? And so I wrote an article on that and it got published. And I have been asked more about that article than anything I've ever written. I've <laughs> been like, I was on like a Netflix show and stuff. And the reason was because, especially for Chinese 
uh, uh, people and people who are the, you know, own Chinese restaurants or the children of Chinese restaurant owners. This was not a small question. This was a, this got to the heart of the, like the racism they experienced uh, throughout their lives. And so this, that, you know, that's maybe one way we should think about it, is we should think like, what is a good question where if I answered it, it would change the way we think about something. Yeah. Um, I feel like that, you know, we're coming to the end of this series. We only have a few conversations left to film. And I've been thinking about ways to kind of end it. And I think it would be really cool to have maybe another panel to that asks those questions. And, but I would also like to think that, you know, if we don't get a chance to organize that, that, that that has come through with some of our conversations because it's been such it has been such a gift to be able to talk not just to historians but also to kinesiologists who have fallen into history or a poet who has is responding to history or a amateur photographer who is at a at a community gathering that starts collecting oral histories because you see history in all of these different ways that are intersecting with people's lives. And for those who aren't kind of official historians, it's less uh, less invited into the classroom than um, official historians. And I think that all those conversations together are so, so powerful. And what can students do if they are introduced to and exposed to all of those different ways that they can ask questions and bring in the methodology of a historian to be able to go deeper, but also to bring the passion of a community member who's sitting with an elder who wants to be able to ensure that they have those stories. Yeah, and and I think this is one of the things I've learned uh, you know, through being a historian is a lot of the most knowledgeable people who've helped me the most have often been sort of these sort of non-professional historians, especially like with my book, culinary historians. Like there are some culinary historians who are not working in the academy who are the most knowledgeable people <laughs> yeah, like yeah. I've ever met. And they hold all of the real knowledge, for instance, about uh, food and cuisine in Canada. Um, and it's the same with the the community-based oral histories I'm doing in Indigenous communities is, you know, these projects are community-owned and directed, and it's the elders who talk about, you know, this is what they want to talk about. And it turns out the stuff they want to talk about is so important. And the and I always think about this, the answers to the questions that they pose and they're, you know, that they're speaking to, they're trying to think, like, what will my children and grandchildren, what do they want to, what do they need to know? Uh, and in doing so, you know, the interviews are, are unbelievably rich, mm-hmm. right? And so they are already skilled historians, right? And you can think about this, like elders in Indigenous communities, this is part of the role of an elder is to be the holder of community histories. Um, uh, yes, I think that's so, sorry to interrupt you, but I, I think that is so interesting to think of, like, when you are sitting in the academy, when you have the resources to be able to fund something, right, to be able to say, like, that's how I can use my expertise, my resources. Um, but when we are building with a community about the questions that they have, like, that is when that becomes so powerful. And that really makes the work of a historian even more and more powerful because of the ways that they can complement and bring to light some of the answers that that community members have on the questions. I think that's such an interesting way to kind of think about it. It's not my project, it's their project. Yeah, and that, that particular project came about, you know, some of the work I'm currently doing um, is on medical experimentation in Indigenous communities. And I've actually had to go to communities and tell them that they've been experimented on. And it's God. been really traumatic. And we've held like community events. And I presented that work. And in one of the communities, I asked, I said, what do you want me to do? Like, what can I do? And I told them what my skills are and what I can offer. And the elders came to them that they wanted to do an oral history project. They wanted to tell their side of the story. Um, and so I said, I can do that. I can, you know, and so we we did a work training youth to do the interviews and conduct them. Um, and we, you know, were able to pay for things like food and uh, for people's time to give people honorariums and ceremonial items. Um, and in the end, that 
none of those interviews are mine. I'm not using them in my research. It's for the community, right? And so this is another thing we, we can rethink. You know, answering those questions sometimes doesn't mean we take ownership over it. It means we kind of use our our resources and skills and our privilege to be able to try to produce things that that are useful to communities. Um, and so, it, yeah, wonderful things about being a historian, right, is that we we actually sometimes have things to offer people that they really want. And sometimes those things are just like our expertise. And other times they're, you know, the resources we're able to bring to bear um, or the skills that we're able to transfer to, to other people. And so that's been really lovely, right, um, doing that kind of work. And in fact, the sort of the youth coordinator of that project that I hired ended up starting a PhD uh, and is using wow. all of the interviews as the basis of her research. So that's the kind of stuff we can we can think of doing. Um, and it's also worth, you know, high school teachers thinking about that, like what can I do to with my students to get them interested in history? Well, part of that is get your students to actually start collecting those histories, you know, what, whether it's material culture or oral histories or, you know, documents that are held within their families. There's a lot you can do um, that'll bring history alive. And it'll, it'll also help start conversations like intergenerational conversations, you know, oftentimes kids feel kind of disconnected from their grandparents when it comes to those sorts of stories. Well, we can, as educators, we can try to like build those connections. Um, and so this kind of, yeah, again, history is problem solving. <laughs> and that problem yeah. might be like how to get someone interested in history, right? Because <laughs> I think a lot of people are more interested than they think they are, or they think history is something that it's not. Yeah. I mean, I, I love, I love that you just said like, um, that historians can provide things that people need, because I think that, I think that a lot of the discourse, you know, there's a, there's a couple articles rolling around the interwebs right now, um, really kind of underlay that, like to think of history as a bit of a vanity thing and to be able to really say like, yes, we're, we can actually problem solve and we can provide things that you need and we can help you articulate the questions that you might have internally, but n don't quite know how to articulate them. Um, this has been so fantastic. I'm so very pleased about the way that we have moved this, but I'm just cognizant of the time. And while I feel like we can talk longer on this, I thought maybe that as a way to to finish or to wrap up the conversation, you could respond to our final official question, which is okay. how can teachers use this to challenge Canadian history? And I, I say this very broadly and you can define whatever this is, however you would like. <laughs> I, I, I think the food guide is great for teaching the history of science and the history of health and challenging some of our ideas about it because it shows, you know, it takes away this gloss of just natural objective truth. And this is how science works. And this is how uh, health education works and asks us to really think more critically and put things in context. Right. And this is kind of important too. And we're, when we're in this era of like growing feelings like anti-science um, and anti-expert and all of these things, to recognize that simply saying, trust the experts, they know what they're doing is not sufficient. Actually, history gives us some tools to talk about how, you know, how can we talk about scientific knowledge? How can we talk about the development of norms around like health and healthy eating in nuanced ways that, that aren't this binary and that are actually really complicated, right? Like I can both love and hate the food guide. Right, yes. <laughs> um, and, and I hold all those things in my mind, right? And we can, you know, historically um, problematize things in ways that also give students tools to think critically about things that they're reading right now. Like the pandemic has left us in this sort of void of misinformation, disinformation, but also the the solution is often just like, well, just just trust trust the experts. <laughs> um, well, let's talk about who's an expert and why and how these ideas come. And really, let's get students to start thinking critically about how knowledge is produced. 
And this is, again, this is history in general. This is, I think, what history does best is looks at the production of knowledge about different things and allows us to ask really difficult questions and come up with complicated answers. The, the more you look at something, the less simple it becomes. You know, the food guide looks like the simple poster. You know, I wrote an entire book on it because there's so much you can say about it. And it's all, it tells you a lot about, you know, the society people lived in at the time. And in my book on history education, I argued that one of the things students really want in their classroom is connection and also complexity. And I think that that's a really nice way for you to end this conversation to identify the complexity that can come from using this as a source. So thank you. This was just so wonderful. Thank you so much for being one of our final participants on the series. <laughs> How can people get in touch with you? How can people um, connect with you if they'd like to? Yeah, if, if you just Google my name uh, and TMU, you'll come on either my personal website or my department website. Both of them have email uh, to contact me. And I, yeah, I'd be more than happy to chat. Yeah, and TMU is Toronto Metropolitan University. That's right. For those people who might, um, yeah, uh, which is uh, it was formerly Ryerson, and so That's now right. it's Toronto Metropolitan University, which is a mouthful. So TMU is a little less. Yeah. I know. I think people wanted it to be Toronto Met, but it just didn't stick. Yeah, that's well, a pretty good name. I, I, but our sports teams are not called the Mets, and so <laughs> I feel like I need to call it Toronto Met. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Um, all right, Ian, have a wonderful afternoon. I know you're running to teaching, to do more teaching today, um, and uh, we'll be in touch. All right, thanks so all much. Right. Bye.